Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Karen Strauss, and I'm a researcher here at Microsoft Research. And today it's my pleasure to introduce doc Dr. John Cumbers. Uh, John is uh, the founder of SymbioBeta, which is a community um, of people uh, and companies, startup companies around synthetic biology. Uh, John has also a pretty interesting background. He uh, has an undergrad in computer science, a master's in bioinformatics, and a PhD in molecular biology from Brown University. And John today is going to talk about the, the scene in the uh, synthetic biology industry. So welcome, John. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Karen, thanks for inviting me. Um, it was a short flight up from, uh, from Mountain View this morning. I live in the heart of Silicon Valley. And uh, I, I've worked at NASA for the last seven years. That's what brought me to Silicon Valley at NASA Ames, uh, right next to Microsoft, actually, in, in Silicon Valley. Um, but after living in Silicon Valley uh, for, for a few years, the startup culture rubs off on you. And so I, I started a, uh, a startup myself. And like most startups, it, it failed pretty quickly. Um, but uh, and so I went back to NASA, but I felt so uh, so restricted after after working in a startup. All the adrenaline rushing through your blood, being able to do whatever you want, hire whoever you want, buy whatever you want, and then back to NASA where you have to fill out all these forms to uh, to hire people or to buy things or to uh, to use your credit card even. Um, so uh, so I went back to NASA, but I only went back four days a week, and on on Fridays I started what is now SynBioBeta. And SymbioBeta is this activity hub for synthetic biology, startup companies, investors, thought leaders. And as the industry has matured, and I'll show you how it's maturing with some charts shortly, um, it's now a, a community for the, for the whole synthetic biology industry. Um, and we run conferences. That's what we started off doing. Um, and we had one just last week in San Francisco. And particularly the theme of this conference was, uh, was where tech meets biotech. And so you'll probably recognize some of the speakers from the tech world on the slide behind me. People like Tim O'Reilly was one of the keynote speakers. Sam Altman, the president of Y Combinator, uh, along with some of the biggest names in the synthetic biology industry. RJ Kirk is the CEO of Intrexon, uh, the, the biggest uh, synthetic biology company out there uh, with a market cap of $4.5 billion. Um, and uh, Jason Kelly, one of the new startups in the field uh, called Ginkgo Bioworks, which recent, recently raised um, $45 million in a, in a Series A. So we bring together uh, the community a couple of times a year, once in San Francisco, once in London. That's how we started as a conference. It's now my full-time gig. I left NASA just last month. Um, and we also do courses, training, and we run a company database keeping track of who's investing in what, who's doing what. Uh, and how the industry is growing. So I'm going to talk today about uh, what synthetic biology is, give you a quick introduction, talk about some of the trends in the industry that we've been tracking and that we see, um, and then talk about some of the companies that are in the industry and what they're doing. Before I do that, um, I, I don't know uh, who's in the audience. So could you put your hand up if you could tell me, and I'm not going to ask you to do it, I just want to know whether you could tell me how a gene relates to a protein. So put your hand up if you've got a good understanding of how a gene relates to a protein. And that's about a good, uh, a, a good kind of 50-50 uh, mix. How, do we know how many people we've got online? OK, well, if anyone online has a question, or if any of you have a question throughout, then please stop and ask. Because as a former uh, computer scientist, uh, I know the pain of the jargon that we have in, uh, in biology and how complicated it is. Um, and uh, I didn't know how a gene related to a protein um, 11 years ago when I made the switch from computer science into bioinformatics and then into, into a PhD in cell molecular biology. Um, so what is synthetic biology? Well, you could argue um, that uh, synthetic DNA is a big part of synthetic biology. This is the birth of Genentech, um, now a multi-billion dollar company based in South San Francisco, the birthplace of biotechnology. And on the blackboard behind the two founders of Genentech, you can see 
uh, a few a few things that are that are critical to uh, to the industry. Um, one is um, I think you can, I don't need the pointer anyway. Okay. It is. It works. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. I'm just not pressing hard enough. Um, so you can see synthetic DNA up on the up on the chalkboard here. Uh, you can see a plasmid, uh, which is a circular piece of, of DNA, um, and you can see a uh, E. coli cell um, uh, up here. And these three things combined into this uh, into this uh, plasmid here. Um, and this is now the the birth of biotechnology here. It's um, it's taking a a cell, a bacterial. Uh, chassis capable of producing things and it's taking a gene of interest such as this piece of DNA which encodes for something interesting and it's putting it uh, onto another piece of DNA and putting it inside a cell. Um, so this is this is really genetic engineering this is what uh, we've been doing for the last 30 some years is uh, taking pieces of DNA that exist in nature putting them into a plasmid and booting that plasmid up into a, into a cell. And once you've done that, you can then start to use uh, technologies such as fermentation, which we've been making alcohol and wine uh, and, other en and other enzymes or, um, or products, and then growing up that organism and producing whatever protein is made from that, um, from that DNA. Um, and this was the first thing that, that Genentech produced. It was a small peptide, a small protein of amino acids linked together, um, and it was insulin. And so in the past, diabetics would get their insulin from uh, slaughtering pigs, taking the pancreas from pigs and cows and slaughtering it and, and using it as human insulin. Now in the future, um, you have humulin, human insulin, which is recombinant, um, and so it takes the DNA directly from your own insulin or human insulin, and it slices it, splices it into a plasmid and boots up that plasmid so that you can brew drugs just like you might brew alcohol, and that's the small peptide insulin. Um, hugely successful, the birth of biotechnology and now uh, a multi-billion uh, dollar uh, industry that we have. Um, but that's not all biology can make. Um, what, what, what could we produce with, uh, with these things? I'm sure you know. It looks like hops. But it is, yeah. It's hops, barley, water. There's one thing missing in the production of beer, uh, which is the yeast. Um, and that's not really put on the label, but it's the most important thing. Um, and uh, there's a wonderful uh, place in San Diego called White Labs. And if you're a home brewer, you probably know White Labs. They sell many different kinds of yeast. And if you go to the, the tasting room at White Labs, you can order a flight of beer, but there's something different about that flight of beer. It's exactly the same uh, ingredients that goes into every beer, but they just change the yeast that's used to do the fermentation and to make the alcohol. And it's, it's five completely different tasting beers, demonstrating that the power of biology for, for making, uh, making things, you can use exactly the same inputs and get five different outputs based on the strain of yeast. Um, and so you can also make these wonderful flavors such as cheese, and you can also make food. Um, does anyone know, or does anyone want to guess what this might be growing in Hawaii? Spirulina. It's spirulina, right. So if you've heard of, uh, if you've seen it in the health food store, it's this spiral shaped bacteria. It's a complete protein source and you can buy it. Uh, and it's grown in, in, in large pools in Hawaii, but it's actually single cell bacteria rather than and any crops. Um, this is Romanescu broccoli, something that looks uh, absolutely beautiful. It also tastes, uh, tastes great. Um, and it just shows the power of biology as a manufacturing technology. Um, as does bread. We, you, you would think that, that there's this amazing property of, uh, of using yeast in bread, something to do with the flavor or the, the enzymes that it produces, but it's actually not. Bread, the, the, you use yeast in bread because it provides uh, gas inside as you're cooking, um, and it has this then wonderful spongy texture. So it's not to do with the taste or the flavor, but actually the texture. Um, and if you, if you look around you on the beach, you see these, these wonderful things, not just soft 
biological gooey, green gooey things, but these amazing uh, shells that you can see for building structure. Um, and if you go into a redwood forest, you can also see these, these phenomenal uh, structures that are over 200 years old um, and dwarf in comparison to the person sitting next to them. And this is an example of an engineered system that was uh, built out of mushroom bricks uh, for the Museum of Modern Art. And not just structural things, but also things that smell good, like this rose. And there's a, one of the companies, Ginkgo Bioworks, is producing this rose-scented perfume. So all this is to try to demonstrate to you the power of biology. It's this versatile uh, manufacturing technology for producing many different kinds of products. But above all, it's a manufacturing technology. And so how genes relate to the proteins, which was the first question that I asked you, is that you have A, C, Ts, and Gs on a, on a double helix of DNA. And through this wonderful mechanism of transcription and translation, which I'll show you a video of in a second, you have these amazing structures, uh, such as these proteins produced on the left-hand side. And that many of the things that you see around in nature, or that you eat, or that do things are proteins. And proteins are, repl are replicated inside of cells, which themselves are self-replicating. So a single cell can divide in 20 minutes if it's a bacterial cell, or a bit longer if it's a mammalian cell. So you have all this self-replicating machinery uh, going on for the production of cells, and then for the production of proteins and enzymes that are made from those cells. And they're all packaged up inside a, a nucleus if it's a, if it's a mammalian cell. Um, into your chromosomes, which you're familiar with in terms of the 23 pairs that you have, are all this information packaged up for the production of stuff. And this is what's actually going on inside your uh, cells. This is a RNA polymerase molecule. This is running along a piece of DNA, and it's actually reading the code. And what we're seeing here, we're about to see, is the conversion of DNA into RNA and into protein. And that's called the central dogma of molecular biology. And in any second now, um, the machinery is going to bind on. This is the RNA polymerase machinery. And it's going to start whizzing along, reading it. And this is uh, an animation, but it's in real time. And you can see uh, the, uh, the ability of this enzyme to run along the DNA. There it goes producing just like a ticker tape coming out the other side, this strand of RNA. And these uh, yellow molecules that are flying around, these are also uh, ACs, Ts, and Gs, uh, with some exceptions for, for RNA. But uh, in general, you can now see the, why I'm saying this is a manufacturing technology, because you can see these, uh, this ticker tape coming out the back. The DNA is being read, and that's in the red color. And the RNA is being produced, and that's in the yellow color. And so all this has been discovered over the last 20 years or so um, is what this machinery is, how it works, and how we can use engineered biology um, as this manufacturing base uh, for the production of many different things, such as I showed in the previous slides. And the, um, the, the, the two technologies which I think are really important uh, for synthetic biologists, one is in the reading of DNA, that is sequencing of DNA. And you can sequence your genome for about $1,000 now. It cost about a billion dollars or more 10 years ago. Um, and then the storage of that sequence information uh, in, a, in, a, in a computational form or in a, in a data form. And then the, the synthesis part, which is then the writing of DNA, uh, which allows us to write anything that we want to write and put it back inside a cell. So what is synthetic biology? Synthetic biology is trying to make biology easy to engineer. So it's not necessarily a, a, a core technology. It's definitely those two technologies of reading and writing DNA. But fundamentally, it's a community of people who want to see a, a very different biological future than the one that we, uh, that we have now. 
And it's a bunch of engineers coming into the field of biology and trying to understand how we can engineer biology. I, I think it's a little akin to Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. That when Web 2.0 came about, uh, there was a huge flurry of activity, a lot of excitement, a new generation of, of people coming into the field, a new generation of investors backing companies and startups in this field, and a new generation of products that we see now, such as Flickr and Twitter and Facebook. Um, but there was also a, a bunch of people who said, hey, what is this Web 2.0? There's nothing, you know, there's nothing to it. We've been doing that uh, since, since the beginning. I think you get a similar thing with synthetic biology. It's built on the foundations of genetic engineering, but there's a number of people who say, well, there's no really new technology. It's kind of just built on what we've been doing all along. And I'll show you some of those technologies uh, uh, and, the, and the, the dates of those uh, technologies, which aren't really new. So there's, I think, some truth to that. But there was one wonderful quote which was in uh, Nature Biotechnology a few years ago, which I think sums up the field very well. Um, I'm not going to read it, but it talks about the principles of engineering and the difference between science and engineering. And a lot of, a lot of uh, scientific principles are underlying synthetic biology, but it's really the engineering and the engineers coming into the field of biology which are, uh, are now trying to make uh, advances in our ability to make things. And the, uh, so the, the quote talks about the Wright brothers and how they didn't, uh, they didn't invent flight. They didn't invent a, an aeroplane by understanding the principles of aerodynamics. Instead, they understood enough to fly a plane and to have a short uh, repeatability cycle, an engineering cycle, so that they could fly many planes and learn from all the ones that crashed. After, after a few years, they, they, they suddenly had a plane that, would, uh, that, that could fly. Um, but only, only years later did scientists understand the principles of aerodynamics, um, that, that they understood how the plane fly, how the plane flew. And I think we're in a similar position with biology. We've got a lot of scientific underpinning that can understand the, the principles of, uh, of molecular biology. But we're really going to make great advances when we try to design things with biology and build things with biology. And later on, the science will catch up with the things that we've managed to build. And my, my favorite quote, which I think predicts the, the, some of the trends that are coming, is by Craig Venter, one of the pioneers in the field, who says, over the next 20 years, synthetic genomics is going to become the standard for making anything. So I'm going to move on to some of the trends that we see coming, but I just want to pause in case there's any questions on anything that I said so far. OK, great. So um, if you look back at the core technologies that I talked about, the discovery of DNA in 1953, that it is a double helix, um, the first uh, string of uh, synthetic nucleotides, ACs, Ts, and Gs, that were strung together in 1972, um, and the first uh, reading of DNA, in terms of the, the, the mass acceptance of reading DNA, uh, Sanger sequencing in 1975. Are you, are you de debating my, uh, my dates, Rob? No, just the DNA on the far right is left-handed. Ouch! That's a big faux pas. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Rob's saying I have the twist of, in the left-handed twist instead of right-handed twist. So I'll, uh, I'll fix that. Photoshop. I'll go back to the, uh, <laughs> the person who did it for me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I think that we're at the start of a fifth uh, industrial revolution. So uh, we've, we've gone through water and steam, electricity, uh, automation in terms of IT systems. I think we're currently in uh, Internet of Things and, and, and a cloud revolution, cloud computing. And I think the next one is, is the bio-industrial uh, revolution through synthesis and sequencing and the predictable engineering of biology. Um, and this chart is, uh, is taken from Rob Carson, who I'm sure, um, if you don't know, you should, you should get to know him, is at the back of the room. The Economist coined Rob's, Rob's data the, the Carson curve, the, um, the equivalent of Moore's law for biology, um, which shows, obviously you're familiar with Moore's law, the, uh, the doubling of the number of, uh, of chips on a, sorry, of transistors on a microprocessor. Um, Rob started to 
see this, uh, this prediction in the falling cost of DNA sequencing and the falling cost of DNA synthesis. So you can see right, reading DNA is on the red line there and writing DNA is on the green, uh, the green line. Um, and we've actually dropped faster than Moore's law at about this rate because this is a log scale. And we were dropping faster than Moore's law here um, in the red. Uh, and it's becoming uh, rapidly cheaper to uh, synthesize DNA, that is to write DNA, and it's already v vastly uh, cheaper to read DNA, that is to sequence it. Yeah? And it flattens because of... Well, it flattens because um, it's, pr it's practically, um, you know, it's extremely cheap at the moment, so it wouldn't, you know, it's, I mean, it's already extremely cheap, so could it could it get much cheaper, Rob? So there's a, in principle, there's another point on there that's an order of magnitude lower, and maybe it's picking up again. It's it's not just about the technology; it's about the economics and the markets. And Illumina co caused basically that crash in the price, starting in 2004 with new technologies, <coughs> and then now they dominate the market and they have no reason to lower the price. So um, it's not as if. Uh, it's not the simple story as it might be with chips, even though that story is more complex. This is John's talk, so I'll shut up. <laughs> so I'll just repeat it for, for people listening online. So, so Rob's saying that Illumina came in here, brought the price down rapidly, and then there's little competition or incentive to, to bring the price down further at the moment. But so it could go, it could go down further. Um, and um, I don't know if anybody saw this paper. It was by Charles Coquel Charlie Coquel's lab at Edinburgh University. Um, it came out in June, and uh, I found it randomly uh, through a Google search for something else, and I really thought it was uh, wonderful. It was calculating the number uh, of, of base pairs of DNA on the planet, and they calculated uh, 5.3 times 10 to the 31 million bases of DNA on the planet, um, and then they came up with this, uh, this uh, operations per second on nucleotide operations um, and compared it to the number of supercomputers that, that it would be uh, today if you, if you treated the whole planet and the number of DNA bases as a computational uh, problem or as, a, as, a comp as, a, as, a, as an operating system, um, showing the equivalent of 10 to the 21 uh, uh, supercomputers so it's a wonderful paper, and I think it, if, if you start to take a step back and look at this ecosystem of, of, uh, of DNA and everything is, is programming and chugging along, just as that video that I showed you, that's for a single gene in a single cell. And my body has 100 trillion cells, and each of those 100 trillion cells has 20,000 genes. And each gene could be transcribed... Um, there could be multiple, well, there are multiple copies. Um, so uh, just inside me at the moment is an incredible biological computing platform, not my brain, but just the DNA itself. Um, so it's a fantastic paper, and maybe that's somebody you want to invite to, uh, to talk to your, to your group in the future. It's sort of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy hypothesis of the, the meaning of the Earth. The Earth is a giant supercomputer designed to answer the question. Okay, you know where I'm going. <clears throat> so the answer is 42. The answer is 42. What is the question? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the funding trends and what's going on in the industry. Um, and this is actually before we dive into the industry, this is federally funded uh, research for synthetic biology. And between 08 and 2014, it's about $820 million. So it's been an initiative of the US government, synthetic biology, in terms of funding the engineering of biology. Um, and, uh, and that's because it's an extremely important area of the economy. And this is also some of Rob's data uh, that he gave to a Senate briefing in 2013, uh, looking at the, this is 2012 data, the total revenue from genetically modified systems is $353 billion in the US. Um, and a, a nice comparison is if you compare it with the worldwide semiconductor revenue uh, for 2012, which was about $303 billion. So it just shows you the power of uh, genetic engineering and, and genetic modification. Uh, and here's roughly it's split between crops, industrials such as chemicals and materials, and biologics, so drugs. 
Um, then if you look at a couple of other trends, this is iGEM, the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. This is the first robotics for synthetic biology. So if you're familiar with the robotics competition, this is the equivalent for genetic engineering. And it's phenomenal. And, and the reason I put this slide in is because Microsoft funded this. Um, back in 2003, um, they, Microsoft gave MIT a, a whole bunch of money for interesting projects. And one of the projects that was funded out of that was the iGEM competition. It wasn't called iGEM at the time. Um, but uh, Microsoft dabbled in synthetic biology for a few years, um, funding some various things. I was at a conference here. Um, in fact, Chris, maybe did we meet then? In, uh, yeah, um, back in 2009 at the University of Washington, 2008, um, about uh, standards for synthetic biology. That's where the synthetic biology uh, language uh, came from SBOL uh, and, and a number of other things. Um, and when you look at the iGEM teams worldwide, there's over 250 of them. A quarter of them are in China uh, and a huge growth in, in the number of teams uh, year on year. It's a lot of fun and uh, there's a UW team that does really well every year as well. Then when you look at the academic publications, it's also going uh, exponential in terms of the number of people t publishing about synthetic biology. And then when you look at the number of companies in the industry, that's also growing. And um, you can see there are over 200 companies that self-identify as synthetic biology companies, growing at about 20, 20 or 25 a year. And we track all this in our company database. In 2015 alone, there's been over half a billion dollars invested in, from venture money in synthetic biology companies. And um, that number of companies is growing, and the amount that's being funded uh, uh, being put into those companies is also growing. Y Combinators got interested in this. This is the early stage uh, seed funding um, based in Silicon Valley. 20% of their companies are now biotech companies, 10% are synthetic biology companies. There's also IndieBio, another accelerator in San Francisco, and, an, and a branch that they have in uh, Cork and Ireland as well. And uh, what's notable is that a lot of the new money that's coming into these companies, um, a big portion of that, half a billion dollars, is coming from tech entrepreneurs. So uh, Bill Gates invested in the Editas Medicine round. Um, Tim O'Reilly, as I talked about earlier, has been investing in, in, uh, in Riffin. Um, y Combinator's funded a whole, a whole number of these. And Eric Schmidt, through his uh, Innovation Endeavors Fund, and, uh, and some of the PayPal founders, such as Peter Thiel. Um, but also you see PayPal, Yahoo, Netscape, Twitter. Uh, a lot of these are uh, tech companies now getting into biotech. John, where do you draw the line between biotech and synthetic biology? Is there like a line? Um, it's exactly, I mean, you could, so the question was where do I draw the line between, um, between biotech and synthetic biology? And it's about the same line that I draw between Web 1.0 and Web 2.0. So I think it's pretty difficult to define. And that's why I made a point of saying that the companies self-identify as synthetic biology companies. Because I see it more as a movement um, of people who want to rationally engineer biology and make it predictable. And um, a lot of the people in biotechnology are more focused on the application rather than the process that they're going through. So. It's a good question, and I'm kind of dodging it. Um, but I'm going to give you some examples of the, um, of the companies that are working in this area. Um, and this, this is something we call the synthetic biology stack. And um, it's just a grouping of the companies that are in the industry, and it's a nice way to think about it. Um, I'm just going to pause any other questions before I dive into the, uh, the third part. So the synthetic biology stack uh, starts at the base with gene and genome synthesis, that is, synthesizing A, Cs, Ts, and Gs. Um, and there are a whole number of companies who are making synthetic DNA. So there's a, um, a yeah, Blue Heron uh, was a Seattle uh, company. It was purchased by Origin, correct? And then was Origin purchased by somebody else recently, or is Origin still? Are Origin in Seattle? No. No. So Blue Heron was one of the early companies in synthetic DNA based here in Seattle. Um, uh, but you can see uh, there's Origin here. 
Um, a lot of these are in um, the Bay Area or Massachusetts. So a, a large number of companies working in this area. And um, it's fast becoming a commodity business to synthesize and make DNA. And as I said earlier, the price is falling. Um, the basic principle are you can make oligos, small strings of ACs, Ts, and Gs, chip-based synthesis, which uh, then synthesizes these on top of a, a substrate, and then assembly technology, which then aligns these sequences together into longer strands. This is one of the uh, uh, new entrants to the market, uh, Emily LaProuste from Twist. They've raised over $80 million. Um, and a new technology based on silicon rather than glass for synthesizing the uh, DNA. Lab Genius, one of the companies from the UK, is making synthetic DNA libraries. That's very uh, diverse strings of DNA, which are used for many different applications. Um, and Synpromics, a Scottish company that is making synthetic promoters. Um, that is, promoters are the short piece of DNA at the beginning of a gene to turn it on or off. And they're using bioinformatics approaches where all of this sequence information that we've been storing in databases for the last uh, decade, they're now using search algorithms to find the genes, find the area before the gene that is a promoter that turns it on or off, and then pulling them all out and then making customized promoters so you can turn on and off different genes at will. John, is this for a specific type of uh, organism? Or? Um, this is only for eukaryotic uh, cells at the moment, so it doesn't work in bacteria, this particular algorithm. Um, and I don't, know any, I, I don't know any more details than that. Um, but there are different, there's different machinery used for bacteria as for um, eukaryotes. Um, and DNA 2.0 um, down in Menlo Park, um, they do machine learning for protein optimization. And I'll come back to machine learning uh, algorithms in a second, but also doing uh, a lot of DNA synthesis themselves. So next up, as we go up this stack, and these all build on each other until we get to the applications at the top, um, are the CAD tools for gene and genome design. And you can see a number of uh, different companies. There are a lot of companies in this space because it's relatively cheap to get into compared to doing wet lab biology. Um, and so just a few of these, Benchling, which was recently funded by Andreessen Horowitz for, um, for doing DNA editing and analysis in the cloud, uh, a very nice tool for, uh, for, uh, for doing that. Desktop Genetics, which has a platform for CRISPR uh, genome editing. CRISPR, you've probably read about in the, in the mainstream press. It's a, it's a very exciting technology that allows you to, um, to edit cells in vivo. That is, I don't need to go through the process of purifying DNA, editing DNA, putting DNA back into a cell, uh, replicating cell. Instead, I can uh, literally inject, uh, in, inject CRISPR, um, Cas9, into my, into, into my leg if I, if I wanted to do that um, and edit the cells directly in, in my leg. And there's been experiments of being able to cure um, uh, paralysis in, in rodent legs by injecting this, uh, this, this uh, CRISPR into it. Uh, it was invented three years ago or discovered three years ago. It's a natural mechanism. Um, and it's uh, from the, in the four years that we've been running the conference, from having no CRISPR talks to about 50% CRISPR talks to now about probably 80% CRISPR talks. Everyone's doing CRISPR, and it's uh, extremely exciting um, to see us speeding up the design, build, and test cycle in, in biology. Um, and at Microsoft Research, Andrew Phillips, who many of you will be familiar with, um, is looking at modeling and coming up with uh, uh, programming language and tools for simulating and analyzing models of complex biological systems. So more systems biology than synthetic biology, um, but definitely some great work going on in the UK uh, at Microsoft Research there. Um, and Riffin is a, is a new company founded uh, two years ago. And Riffin is a platform technology for uh, cloud analytics of lab data. So it feeds in a lot of different uh, data from, from the lab and uh, has a platform for analyzing that. 
Um, this is a, a, a fairly new area, Cloud Labs and automation. Cloud Labs is just like uh, um, Azure or AWS or Google. I um, can't remember what Google's platform is called, but Google, whatever that company's platform is called. Um, and uh, this is really exciting because the same thing's happening to biology. Instead of having mainframe, uh, instead of having uh, expensive lab equipment in your own lab, um, you can now rent out lab equipment in somebody else's lab. So there are two companies that are doing that, Emerald Therapeutics and Transcriptic. Um, and they have automated uh, labs, and you can um, use an API for, uh, for using those, lab, lo those pieces of equipment, those pieces of equipment in their lab. So you can send them samples, you can put it in their machines, they will run your script that you've written and send you back either the data or the sample. You don't need to own a lab. Um, and we're calling this virtual bio, the idea that you don't need a expensive lab anymore or even a lab at all um, to, to have a biotech startup. So uh, John, how general are, are these pipelines? Because depending on, you know, if you have different experiments, they don't have the equipment, you can't do it. So how complete and general are, are these platforms? Sure. So the question is how complete are the platforms? Um, I think it's pretty, I mean, Transcriptic has, um, I, I, I think the answer is, you know, the, the, the forefront of biology is, is, the forefront of science is always bleeding edge. So at, the, at, the, at labs, you're always going to get somebody trying to come up with a new assay or a new way of doing something or inventing a new piece of equipment to solve the question that they're trying to answer. So it's difficult to, to say how, you know, on a scale of how complete they are. I think for, for all standard molecular biology procedures, such as purifying DNA, extraction, growth, mixing, and analysis, I think 100%. Um, then when you start moving to new things, they're, 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 they're constantly playing catch up. But I think it's pretty good. One thing that we're doing, and I'll come onto this in a second, is a, is a competition called Blue Sky Bio, where we're giving out resources to startups to have them um, come up with new ideas of startups that they can do relying on technologies like this. And so for an, for an academic pursuit, it's may, it, the, it, it will be limited because you're at the edge of the envelope in terms of what you're trying to come up with. But for a startup that you're doing, you could, you could view it as a different problem. I have these resources available to me, and what problem can I answer with, so that I don't need a lab? So I think it's a different kind of experiment, different kind of question you do. Yeah. Um, and Emerald Therapeutics, I think, more focusing on the analytics side in terms of uh, drug development and, uh, and, and analysis. Yeah. So for these kind of experiments, uh, like how long would it take? How long would the experiment take? It depends. You could do a bacterial growth curve, looking at how fast bacteria grow in just a few hours. Um, if it's not a, if it's something f faster than that, uh, let's say a, a light assay where you're looking at the uh, production of light, it could be just a few seconds. So, um, or it could be if it's a slow-growing bacterium, it could be weeks. And um, there are different business models for how you pay for these products uh, as well, whether they're per hour or they're a, um, a, a subscription model. So, um, and then, so I've got automation companies on here as well. You've got companies that are looking at automation of, of processes. Uh, LabSite is, has this amazing piece of equipment for liquid handling, for moving droplets of liquid around using sound. So if, if you've been in a molecular biology lab any time in the last 100 years or 50 years, you, you know, there's a lot of pipetting, a lot of move, moving of liquid, a lot of repetition. So you're uh, hiring the, you know, the smartest people in the world to, to stand at a lab bench and, and concentrate on a repetitive task for, for, for six years <laughs> of a PhD. It's not, uh, it's not the most productive use of time. So, uh, you know, I think this is a huge area for growth in terms of the ability to automate a lot of this. And um, is it Eric 
Clavens at UW who's got this, uh, is it Aquarius? His Aquarium. Aquarium. His, uh, his company is well worth a, a visit. I haven't been there, but I hear it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting. So, um, yeah, so a lot of these companies working on automation and cloud labs. So this is Transcriptic that I mentioned just now, um, and they've been funded about $14.5 million, um, and really looking at uh, lowering costs, increasing precision, um, and allowing you to automate a lot of these tasks. This is a really interesting company in the UK that allowing you to do tens of millions of cells at a time uh, and uh, analyzing them using mass spec. So at the moment, mass spectrometry is very expensive for looking at the, the, the atoms that are inside a, a, a sample. This can do tens of millions of cells, um, vastly faster and cheaper than anything that's out there. So then as we move up more towards the biology and less away from the tools, we see um, uh, organism engineering platforms. That means you've created an organism or a set of organisms or a set of tools and you're able to use uh, these organisms for producing many different things. So there's a number of companies in this area. Um, so uh, Ginkgo Bioworks is one of the, uh, one of the um, early companies and this was the first company that Y Combinator funded. Uh, so they have a platform for high throughput automation of strain engineering. So if you want to produce a, uh, a yeast cell that has a particular smell characteristic because you're producing a perfume, um, then you can give your uh, strain to them and they would ramp up the production of that particular molecule. Or they will design the organism for you uh, if you have some new uh, fragrance that you want to design or a food product or a material product. product. Uh, Zymogen's in a similar category to that. Uh, uh, Zeta, which is here in Seattle, um, is uh, doing similar, using a big data platform and machine learning to, uh, to optimize the production of pharmaceuticals. Um, Synthase is a company that's based in the UK. Um, they, instead of taking in the organism in-house, they will um, sell a complete system end-to-end -end for a company that might want to have an automated um, system for the production of uh, whatever the company is producing. So, and Anther is a new programming language that they've produced for engineering of biology. Um, and this is uh, Tim Fell, who's the CEO. Zymogen, who um, recently raised 44 million in a Series A, a very similar business model to Ginkgo that I mentioned just a second ago, uh, and working in chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and food. And then right at the top layer, we have uh, the applications. So the lines kind of blurred between the platforms and the applications because some companies make both. Um, but you can see a lot of the interesting applications, a lot of the CRISPR companies that I just mentioned, that tool for in vivo editing, such as Intellia or Editas or CRISPR Therapeutics or Caribou. Um, but then also some of the more interesting uh, uh, applications are things like bolt threads, which is uh, spider silk. This is Dan Widmeyer, who's the CEO. You might have seen that North Face uh, jacket that just came out last week, made of spider silk. That's a competitor to, to these folks. Um, they've raised $40 million to date, and they've taken the genes from the spider, and they've put them into uh, bacteria or, or, or yeast, and they are now able to spin uh, spider silk, just like you might um, grow yeast for production of alcohol. They're now able to grow spider silk uh, instead of alcohol or a mixture of, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so uh, really interesting uh, performance properties of, uh, of these fabrics because they're able to engineer the DNA and engineer then the, the property of the material that they're producing. Uh, this is a French company called Elego Bioscience. They're actually uh, doing engineered probiotics. You've heard of probiotics in yogurt and uh, things to keep your gut uh, uh, in good shape. They're engineering those organisms uh, for particular uh, uh, health properties. Um, another French company, Thomas Landrain, is uh, making the first renewable inks, that is things for dyeing materials, which is a very uh, uh, um, damaging process to the environment, the whole process for producing inks and bio-based uh, uh, solutions can be much more sustainable, non-toxic. Um, and recyclable as well. 
And Arzita that I mentioned earlier, uh, who has this computational platform um, for metabolic engineering, and they're particularly working in uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals, and they're based here in Seattle. Um, I wanted to touch on big data and machine learning because this was the session that Andrew Phillips chaired at our conference just last week. Um, and we, uh, we had a giant um, competition. This was the giveaway that I mentioned, this Blue Sky Bio competition. And Microsoft was a sponsor of this competition, so we gave out um, cloud uh, computing Azure time to, uh, to the winner of the competition, which was Colaba Bioscience. And Colaba is based down in San Diego. Um, and uh, Iwa Liss is the founder. And they're also making an engineered probiotic strain of yogurt. So the idea is uh, that uh, one of the cures for depression or one of the treatments for depression is, is tryptophan, a, a particular amino acid. Um, but if you, it's known to, to cure depression, but if you, you have to eat a huge amount of tryptophan in order to do that. So uh, Iwa's idea was to produce a yogurt that had this probiotic strain in it that would produce higher levels of tryptophan. So you could eat your yogurt for breakfast and it would contain this probiotic. Um, this has never been shown before, never, never gone through uh, approval for this kind of medicine where you're actually eating uh, the, the organism that's producing the drug. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot more of it because we have more bacterial cells in your gut than you do human cells in your body by many times over. Um, so we're starting to understand and work with the organisms that are living with us rather than trying to kill them all with antibiotics. Um, and in particular, she was using these uh, modeling tools and data analytics to try to find the, uh, the proteins that she could express or the circuit that she could build for uh, the tryptophan production. Um, and she gave this wonderful talk where she really outlined um, the problems in machine learning that you can solve using synthetic biology, which I thought might be of interest to, to you folks. Um, how to optimize promoters and pathways. We talked about that. How can we design these various things, either a promoter, which was what the Scottish company um, Simpromix was doing, or a pathway, which she's doing for tryptophan production. Um, trying to understand which genes are essential. Um, or which can be used uh, for fermentation on different scales. Uh, and the areas that she thought were interesting for the future um, was uh, for, for gene discovery, um, understanding which hosts could be used for the production of different things. Um, that is, which organism, maybe yeast or bacteria, or different kinds of yeast or bacteria. Um, and then which drugs could be used for different patients. So she gave a really good talk outlining uh, the, uh, the different options for that. Um, so I wanted just to wrap up and talk about a couple of events that we've got coming up, um, uh, coming up next year. One, we're doing a big event in London in the beginning of April. And we've been doing an event in London for four years. And then uh, we're, our first event in China will be in June 2016, really trying to understand uh, what's going on in China and, and uh, organize a tour of uh, synthetic biology companies there. Um, if you're interested in learning more, we do, take, we do um, do courses in synthetic biology, and we send out a weekly email news digest about who's doing what and who's getting funded and what products there are available. Um, and with that, I'll thank you all for listening, and I'll take any questions. Yeah. Question. At one time, uh, sort of safety in the industry, I remember the iGEM conference, there was a lot of controversy about, you know, just set, turning all these people loose with these tools. It was a big issue. Uh, are people still worried about it, or is it, have we just sort of outgrown it at this point? What, what's the current uh, thinking? Um, that's a good question about safety in the industry. And um, I think the biggest fear was that if you give anybody access to these tools, then anybody could create a biological weapon in their basement or anybody could kill somebody. Uh, and I think iGEM's done a really good job of building in biosafety into the educational curriculum. 
And I think it's a much more practical training in safety than you might get just through following some regimented thing at a university. So I think safety from that regard, I think, is uh, it's definitely not forgotten. It's front and center of the competition still. Um, and it's taught on, in every undergraduate uh, uh, team. I think in terms of the, you know, will people create, um, create nasty strains to create bioweapons and things like that in their basements? Um, I think potentially, but th with every technology there comes from an engineering point of view a responsibility to do good with the technology and there's the potential to do bad with it as well. And um, you can you could cultivate anthrax from from soil I'm sure here in in Seattle um, without needing to go to the extent of trying to genetic engineer something and anthrax is pretty bad so I think with the knowledge that's out there you can already do pretty nasty things so I think what the field has done is to grow this pool of responsible use and people who think smart about what they can do with the technology and what they want to do with the technology Questions? All right, let's thank John again.